We have also formed a quorum. So, Deputy Chairman, can you come over? Bureau Director, are you going to stay with us? Please be seated, uh, but then uh, please remain seated while we deal with some um, in-house issues. Colleagues, both the Deputy Chairman and I would like to discuss the issue with the deputations and then uh, we would also like to see the report from Dr. Or Professor Nelson Chow, but according to press reports, apparently the report will only be available on the 1st of July. So we've been asking the Bureau Director to submit the report to us uh, in June, but then apparently it's going to be difficult. So what's your view? Yes, Dr. K.K. Kwok. Madam Chair, there have been a lot of rumours um, in the community and uh, it's unsettling. Some said that, uh, well, Everything will have to go through John Zhang, and uh, he's not going to give us the full report, and uh, some of it uh, might have to be redacted. Uh, why does it have to be postponed for such a long time? Because uh, we have already given all our views to the administration, any so called report to be submitted by the administration. What kind of report is that going to be? Because what we're asking for is um, a full report uh, with all the data with regard to individuals, political parties, what questions have they have been put to them, and uh, what's the administration uh, held by the administration, and how did you do the calculations, whether it's feasible or not feasible. I think um, uh, it's totally unacceptable for the administration to just uh, digest some of the information and then uh, disclose a part of it to the community. And uh, Bureau Director, if you uh, try to do that, then uh, it simply is not going to work. Yes, uh, Lang Yu Chong. Madam Chair, I, I would have thought that uh, the work done by Professor Chow should be independent, so he should have full autonomy as to what and how that should be done. But then uh, towards the end of it, how come, according to some rumours, well, some data would have to be based on the FS uh, working group on long-term uh, fiscal planning, because I do question that the data are not just um, conservative, but then are they been uh, prepared by the working group, and whether or not it's accurate or not uh, is uh, debatable. So why does Professor Chow have to base his calculations on the data provided by John Zhang and his team? Because uh, pro supposedly Professor Chow is to do the calculation on its own to see if it's feasible. So why does he have to rely on the data supplied by John Zhang's working group? And what kind of implications will that bring? So in terms of the timeline, it's already late. And also with regard to the um, implications uh, of basing his calculations uh, on the data provided by uh, John Zhang's working group, uh, what would that be? Well, according to Professor Chow, there has been a delay by two months because of um, the fact that uh, he had to do his calculations on the basis of um, uh, the working group's uh, data. And I was worried that uh, we may not be able to make it up before the summer break. All right, we have five guests, and uh, they'd like to tell us uh, how they feel about uh, the proposal. So, um, Bureau Director, please be brief. Well, Madam Chair, well, there has been no delay whatsoever. If you've been um, watching over this uh, very carefully, well, we have asked Professor Chow and his team to do it, and the timetable is the middle of this year. That is, before the middle of this year, the report has to be ready. So. By mid of the year, we mean the 30th of June. That is before the 1st of July. So all in all, overall speaking, is still within our timeline. So there has been no delay whatsoever. It's just that because of uh, the workflow or the flowchart of Professor Chow, he has to make some adjustments. And um, Professor Chow also promised. I also contacted him yesterday. That is up uh, before the end of June. He would definitely be able to submit the report uh, to us. And then after receiving the report, uh, as the chief executive said very clearly at the Q&A session in this council, well, the Poverty Commission will definitely be looking into the report, and then it will come up with an appropriate manner. Uh, 
in which the report will be disclosed uh, to the community, including this subcommittee. So definitely, we have we have to um, have an exchange or dialogue with you. So please rest assured, the report uh, will be disclosed. Dr. Kwok, well, please do not play with Silver Street, because I've been asking for the full data, all the um, primary data, but then a. Apparently, you're still resorting to the um, uh, the language tactics deployed uh, by Mr. C. Y. Leung that uh, it will be disclosed in an appropriate manner. So, will we be able to see the full report uh, as submitted uh, by Professor Chow? I'm only asking for uh, one report. Uh, that is the full report submitted by Professor Chow. Definitely, the Poverty Commission will be looking at uh, the report submitted by Professor Chow and then determine the way in which it's to be released to the public because that uh, the public's right to know and transparency and everything, all these will be considered. So can you promise that after he has submitted the report to you, well, to be fair, Professor Chow does have the right to disclose the report and even pass it on to us. If there is nothing to hide, then all right, you've spent so much money and you've asked him to prepare this report. Does he have the right to disclose it to the public? If that is the case, then at least we can be rest assured. Because even if we do not trust C. Y. Lung, we can at least trust Professor Chow. Well, Chairman, uh, we have asked Professor Chow to prepare the report, and uh, it's a matter of uh, course that uh, the report should be submitted to us, and then the Commission would decide the way in which the report will be disclosed. Uh, but then we haven't received the report yet, uh, but then please uh, give us some time. In early July, we're going to decide how and when it's going to be released. Well, we have talked to the administration on various occasions, and then uh, the report will be submitted uh, to them by the 1st of July, and then the Poverty Commission's um, working group will be looking into this, and then it will decide on when it's going to be released. All right. Uh, well, um, our meeting in July will be held on the 22nd. So after listening to the deputation's views, we'll make a decision because uh, after listening to their views, uh, there might be some matters of principle which we may have to resolve with the administration because we are also worried ourselves that in the end, will the administration have to conduct another round of consultation or what? So we are not sure. Well, normally, um, on the twenty-first, by the twenty-first of um, July, you will have to submit the report uh, to the subcommittee, and there is no reason why you should delay it any further. And then on the twenty-second, we're going to have another discussion. So as to what we're going to do next, uh, we'll decide after today's meeting. Well, um. Uh, the community's uh, wishes that uh, we should come up with our own views. So we'll decide after meeting with the deputations today. All right. <coughs> so bureau director, you should submit a report uh, by the 22nd of July to us. Please do not delay it any further. Okay. Let's invite the let's invite the deputations to join us. Well, we met a total of uh, 69 deputations uh, last time with our two-day meetings, and uh, today we're going to meet with some deputations with their own proposals. So five groups will be here. We have the Neighborhood and Workers Service Center, and then Alliance for Universal Pension. Hong Kong Society, Hong Kong Social Security Society, and also the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Union uh, Rights and Benefits Committee, and also the Professional Commons. So five deputations altogether. Please come in and take your seats. In the front, please. If you have any written submission, please pass it on to our staff, and then they will make copies for us. So please do not distribute them here. 
um, in a conference room. If you have to do it, uh, then you will have to give it to our staff, and then our staff will do it for you. Welcome to you all. Welcome. Hello, we hold a meeting. Please be seated. Hi, Fuyin Daga. Welcome to you all. Welcome. I'd like to remind the deputations that uh, you are not protected by the Electrical Pass and Privileges Ordinance, CAP 382, and your submissions will also not be covered by the Electrical Pass and Privileges Ordinance, so you not enjoy any uh, immunity under the ordinance. And through various channels, we have asked the deputations and also those in the public gallery to observe the um, guideline for the public um, in attending electrical meetings. So uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of that. And uh, for those of you who have not been able to submit your written submissions uh, in time for the meeting, please do so after the meeting. And um, we don't have a lot of time today, so every deputation will be given a chance to speak. And um, each deputation will be given 10 minutes, as you have seen the um, agenda. So the Neighbourhood and Workers Service Centre will be speaking uh, as group number one, and then Alliance for Universal Pension, and then Hong Kong Social Security Society, and then the HKFTU so Rights and uh, Benefits Committee, and then the Professional Commons. And then uh, you have the earpiece uh, on the desk, and if you'd like to tune into uh, the floor, is zero, Cantonese is one. English is two, and Putonghua is three. So you can put on the earpiece if you need interpretation service. And if you need any assistance, please uh, talk to one of our staff. Well, quite a number of you have been fighting for universal retirement protection for a long time already. And uh, so let's see how things are going. We are here to listen to your views, and we hope that you can work together with the LegCo in monitoring the work by the administration. First of all, Neighbourhood and Workers Service Centre, Mr. Chao Kem Pui, and also Mr. Wong Yun Tat. So two of you who will speak, 10 minutes each. So we'll count the time. Yes, Wong Yun Tat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, for universal retirement protection, we have discussed that for a long time, and the um, NWSC has come up with a specific proposal for the community to discuss. First of all, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, the guiding principles. First, uh, we hope that it's universal, and uh, that will be somewhat different from the current MPF system, because only the workers will be eligible, but then uh, for housewives, homemakers and retirees, they do not have a job and therefore they will not be protected. So first of all, it has to be universal uh, as long as they are 65 years of age and are Hong Kong permanent residents, they should be eligible. Second, the proposal we're proposing, uh, the contribution scheme uh, should be in line with the population peak, so we will have an explanation later on. We also feel that the retirement plan should be sufficient. Uh, previously, we called for $3,000, and with uh, inflation, uh, we think it should be $3,500, $4,000. Uh, aside from cash subsidies, 
there should also be other support, including medical and housing support. That should not be uh, omitted. So after receiving uh, retirement protection, there shouldn't be a cut in other services. We need to maintain a low medical cost and low cost housing. Uh, lastly, we feel that MPF should be scrapped. So these are our uh, universal retirement protection principles. Second, we'd like to talk about our the content of our plan. So for the elderly to benefit, you cannot we cannot scrap MPF uh, immediately. We need to uh, that cannot solve the problem. So the government should set up a 200 billion or more uh, seed fund. So this fund through the budget surplus and a contribution of 40 billion, uh, the government should contribute for five years and it should uh, add up to some 200 billion because if we have investment uh, returns, it should be more than 200 billion. So if the government uh, is a bit more aggressive, they can commit to 200 billion in three or four years, so we would uh, support that, but we are calling for five years to set up the seed fund. We have this five-year transition period, and in the fifth, sixth year, all senior citizens above 65 should be eligible. And how do we deal with MPF? We want to scrap MPF, and if MPF should be a voluntary contribution scheme. Employees can uh, cancel their subscription to MPF and uh, withdraw their employee employer's contribution. If they don't scrap it, they can handle, hand it over to agents to run. So people who have uh, who are running MPF funds, they have a five-year transition period to conduct other business. So if uh, the MPF is converted to universal uh, retirement protection, that won't create immediate chaos. Uh, the transition period should uh, minimize these problems. And How is contribution? How are contributions made? It's a three-party contribution. It includes employee, employers, and the government. They would each contribute five percent. It's similar to the current MPF. So, employee employers are contributing in proportion to the salary. We don't need to make it more complex. The government also makes a contribution. So to give you an example, if an employee with a salary of 12000 and that is $600, the employee employer contributes 600 each. The government will also contribute 600 so that adds up to 1800 In 2012, the average salary was uh, $12,000. So uh, if we have $1,800 contribution per month, and the peak, uh, we'll have two workers subsidizing an elderly. So we have uh, 3600 So this is not calculated by an actuarial uh, scientist, but this should be able to support uh, elderly person receiving 3500 uh, uh, subsidy. So we also make reference to the MPF contribution where they have a ceiling and a cap. Uh, the current cap is 7100 uh, where employees don't need to, to contribute because we want we don't want to add burden to low income groups. But the ceiling will be increased. We want to extend it from 30,000 to 60,000 because 
those who are capable should be should uh, assist those who are less able so we want to extend the ceiling for the self-employed they also need to contribute so uh, we have provided a simple uh, uh, briefing of, and I want to summarize with the advantages of our proposal by scrapping the MPF employees savings uh, do not need to be eroded by MPF because we see the MPF after some 10 odd years of contribution you can see that employees they have contributed but the return is not ideal and in fact uh, it is even er eroded uh, they get less than what they paid for so we want to scrap the MPF uh, we don't want uh, fund managers to erode their savings and the second advantage of our proposal is that in a few years time the elderly can benefit immediately and we can have this cross generation support and third uh, it's a three-party contribution it's simple uh, and the contribution system uh, will be based on the framework of the NPF so employee employers should be able to accept that and then lastly when the government starts the f fund, the retiring seniors can maintain a uh, lifestyle. So uh, that is the gist of our proposal. You can refer to our written submission. And yesterday we also sent a PowerPoint to the panel. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, uh, the government has emphasized the using the three pillars of the World Bank to design the retirement plan. But the World Bank in 05 had said there are five pillars. There are two extra pillars. So the extra pillars are we need a universal protection plan. The World Bank also said this should allow the grassroots or elderly have a basic uh, lifestyle, maintain a basic lifestyle. So when the grassroots organizations talk about universal time and protection, we're talking about maintaining a basic lifestyle. And 3500 is not generous or uh, aggressive demand. So the Kai Fong Kong Yao uh, are calling for the government to progress uh, al along with the times and uh, we should move beyond the three pillars and, uh, and step up to the fact that the World Bank has, is calling for five pillars now. The next deputation uh, will be next deputation is the Alliance for Universal Pension. Who will be going first? Uh, Mr. Lao Chak Thank you, Chairman. The Alliance for Universal Pension will divide its speech into two parts. We will be talking about our option, our plan, uh, problems Hong Kong is facing, some statistics, and the second part will be uh, talking about what grassroots programs we have undertaken, uh, do we have a consensus, we'll deal with that in the second part where we have uh, conducted some uh, surveys so before we talk about universal pension, uh, we have had discussions about uh, welfare in Hong Kong. A lot of people are aware that uh, the CSS has a labeling effect. It has a very stringent. <coughs> it has very stringent uh, means testing, and so on. Oxfam has done some studies. 
50 cent, uh, 50 cent of, uh, people who are eligible for CSS do not apply for it. So this system cannot cope with elderly, poor, and an aging population. So the government says that they have old age allowance, but a lot of frontline organizations they say that ever since implementation, the it has been very divisive in society. Some people qualify, some don't. Those who qualify, they need to go through. The, their uh, definition of assets is not clear. They have to go through means testing. So it is very divisive in society. We also see the old age living allowance. Uh, it's $2,280 odd dollars. It uh, can't cope with uh, current levels of inflation. So the elderly will have spent money. Uh, money has been spent, but uh, the feedback is not positive. It's very decisive. Uh, the fruit, mon the so-called fruit money, is also very minimal. It can't uh, pay rent. Uh, you can't live on it. The MPF also has problems, especially for the grassroots. There's offsetting problem. A lot of grassroots workers, their MPF by retirement age, it has already been offset. And uh, some women, if they're if they don't have jobs, they don't have MPF. So, given these circumstances, we're proposing universal pension. So, it's different from the surplus welfare idea. So, society f uh, funds it uh, ahead of time. There's a pre-funded element. We need to calculate the aging population and make a budget and we need to save in advance. Second, the plan uh, focuses on sharing. We don't want one particular stakeholder to uh, to uh, foot the bill. We feel that corporate corporations, profitable organizations, uh, they have a responsibility. So we have to, it's um, uh, the idea is to share a responsibility. So, and I think it's also the same for all universal pensions. There should be no means testing. So once they reach age of 65, they need to have a basic pension. Uh, and our proposal is the same. So our proposal wishes to generate debate. We want to put forward a proposal uh, and creates uh, and uh, stimulates discussion among society. So coming to the proposal, as I said just now, it's a universal pension with no means testing. Uh, we propose $3,000, but you need to bear in mind, this is 2010 uh, $3,000, but if you calculate inflation, it should be more than 3000 It should be 34 3500 you need to bear that in mind. The contributions come from a few parties, employee, employers. They would contribute 2.5%. So half of the MPF is uh, diverted to this universal pension. So there's no extra contribution. The caps are also the same with the MPF. In terms of government's commitment, the government will continue to provide the standard rate um, for CSSA and um, also the OA8. And uh, we also need to have a $10 billion uh, seed money. And then for the um, employed, uh, for the conglomerates, uh, there should be a 5% um, extra progressive profit tax. Well, 
According to our calculation in 2005 and 2009, we did some projections and basically by 2041, there should be over $120 billion surplus uh, in the fund. Now coming to some of the changes in recent years. Well, the government's uh, commitment has increased uh, in 2009 uh, before we, uh, well, b when we made the projections, uh, we still hadn't got the OALA. And then in 2009 and 10, the administration promised that uh, there'd be an extra $6.2 billion. And then by 2041, there'd be this extra $16.2 billion in the form of OALA. And then for profit tax, uh, the 2009 projection was also rather conservative. It's only $71 billion because of the um, uh, performance of the economy. And now it's already close to $120 billion, according to the latest uh, projections. And therefore, uh, our the uh, financial position of our package should be even more sound. Well, as we have said, uh, well, we have set up this uh, alliance for universal pension for 10 years. And uh, in November last year, we came up with uh, well, we actually organized uh, a discussion day involving some 300 participants and other than some elders, we also have some from the uh, middle class, some women's groups and also some professionals discussing the issue with us. So we tried to identify a consensus and most of the participants can see that, well, um, the present three pillar approach will not be able to resolve uh, the basic needs of the retirees. And also, with regard to the way forward, well, universality is a basic principle. In other words, there should be no means test whatsoever. And we sh also sh should offer a flat rate so as to ensure that the elders will have uh, will be able to have a reasonable basic living. And also, is a share uh, responsibility for both the administration, the employers and the workers. So a few days ago, we've been asking the question of where does the money come from? In fact, uh, one of the stakeholders, uh, well, we, we we have to have a tripartite uh, contributory system before the system can be um, sustainable. And uh, who should top up everything? Well, we need to have a community discussion and consensus. And uh, it has to be immediate and there has to be a comprehensive package to back it up. But then uh, with regard to the alliance, as far as the alliance is concerned, we are very concerned about one thing because in mid-May, uh, they have that uh, well, there were some reports, and the administration apparently has been giving instruction to the uh, Poverty Commission and also, and also Professor Nelson Chow's uh, working group. Apparently, the data from the working group on long-term fiscal planning will have to be incorporated. But then for the working group itself, if you look at the data, there is an assumption that is uh, with an aging population, the productivity will come down. And that will also uh, put a lot of uh, financial burden to bear on the administration. So it's purely from the uh, economic and uh, financial perspective. And many academics have uh, questioned that with regard to the data from the working group, is it credible and also uh, are the assumptions reasonable? And therefore, if this is so controversial and if the administration does not deal with that and just uh, impose that on the study conducted by Professor Chow, we believe that uh, it's very problematic. And also, would that become political interference with academic studies? So we would like to put this question to Mr. Chair, the bureau director, because uh, in the Economic Journal on the 14th of May, there was an article saying that uh, after the senior management of the administration had seen uh, the data from the working group on long-term fiscal planning, it it breathes uh, a sigh of relief because uh, it proved that uh, universal retirement protection is not sustainable. So is that the case? And uh, can you clarify whether or not the report has been accurate or not? And what the alliance is asking for is very simple because uh, in the in CY Leung's uh, uh, election manifesto, he talked about uh, uh, this um, uh, old age uh, pension scheme, and he will have to honor this promise. And also with regard to Professor Chow's report, we would like it to be uh, fully disclosed uh, because at the Q&A session by CY Leung last week, he said that uh, he had never promised that uh, it would be he would be disclosing or releasing the full report. So can you promise uh, to the alliance as well as the community that uh, Professor Chow's uh, report will have to be released in full instead of um, uh, a redacted version. And we also have to have a timetable and uh, a roadmap for universal retirement protection. 
Next, Hong Kong Social Security Society, Mr. Henry Mock and uh, Mr. Apple Leung. Good morning. Thank you. Well, to save time, Mr. Mock will be briefing you on the details of a package. Basically, it's very similar to some of the earlier packages. What well, we have been fighting for universal retirement protection for several decades and uh, citing the example of the employment ordinance, uh, what well, we fought for maternity leave uh, uh, benefit while well, my wife was uh, bearing uh, a child and now my son is in his 30s. I hope that by the time when he retires, I'm still I'm worried that uh, uh, the issue is still under discussion, is still very much a controversy. All right, I've already retired. We hope that uh, while we are still alive, we hope to be able to get universal retirement protection, uh, protect re uh, universal retirement protection for the entire community. Number one, it has to be universal, and number two, it has to be contributory. So it has to be a tripartite uh, contribution system, and it has to be immediate. As I said, many people might not live long enough um, uh, for it to be implemented, and such unfairness should not uh, continue. And fourthly, we hope that uh, we can converge with the international trend, as we said, uh, under the ILO and also the International Human Rights Convention and also the World Bank's uh, standards. And the administration should not uh, uh, hide behind uh, the issue. It's not a time for debate now. It's, the, it's a time for action. Next, uh, Mr. Falk, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Apple Leung, the president, because uh, during the past two weeks uh, he bought two books. That's why we had the latest uh, figures. And uh, we have only been able to submit it uh, today because actually we haven't finished reading the two books uh, because it's uh, very rich. And we have submitted uh, some updated information to the Secretariat. Uh, we have not been able to do so beforehand. So it's a three page document. Altogether, six, it's a six page document. So. Has every one of you got a copy of that? Uh, sorry, uh, is the latest um, and mo the up most updated information. All right, uh, is the Social Security Society's uh, proposal. Basically, it has to be uh, universal, but then uh, for the Central Provident Fund, it has to be the second tier. So we would like to have um, a universal uh, pension fund. So I'll be focusing on the first tier, that is the Universal Pension Fund, and then for the Central Provident Fund, we would like to propose an, en propose an enhanced version. All right, uh, on the first tier, that is the Universal Pension Fund, uh, well, all the data have been based on uh, solid grounds. Number one, we have um, looked at the statistics are provided by the CNS department, for example, the uh, average uh, wage, we look at uh, the census, and also the by census data. So that's the average wage, and uh, that has been provided to us by the CNS department. And uh, for the rest, uh, we looked at international data and also uh, data from literature. And therefore, if you want us to provide the data, we can provide that, including some of the articles that we have published uh, in 2011. So all the data have come from the CNS department and also from the international community. With regard to the universal pension scheme, that's very. It's very clear that uh, we look at the average wage, and uh, we take twenty percent as the rate for the universal pension fund. And in twenty eleven, in a census cal uh, done by the CNS department, is nineteen thousand dollars. And therefore, uh, projecting it into twenty fourteen, it should be over twenty thousand dollars. That's the average wage. And if we take 20% of that, then that should be taken as the universal pension fund for 2014. It should be $4,000 a month. And um, last year in September, the administration also released a report on the poverty line and for a single ton is $3,600, and therefore, all right, uh, let's say if it's to be implemented in 2016, then the latest uh, poverty line 
should be um, set at about uh, $3,900. And therefore, what we are asking for, $4,000 a month, is slightly above the poverty line. And therefore, we believe that uh, that's very important. So we need to have this universal pension fund setting at being set at $4,000. And uh, it's a contributory system that would also cater for um, the um, fluctuation in our economy. So whether it's uh, uh, turning for the better or for the worst, uh, the elders will be able to share in the fruit of success of our economy. And second, it has to be a tripartite contributory system. And uh, it's very simple, 246. So for the employees, uh, 2%. And then for the administration, 4%. And then for employers, it's 6%. As for employees, uh, if they are earning less than uh, $10,000, they do not have to make any contribution at all. And then for employers, they will have to contribute 6% on behalf of their employees. As for the sustainability, we have also done some in, um, uh, research uh, into international uh, trends, and uh, we have already submitted that to this council. And you can also refer to the first table on page 2. As you can see, we have adopted uh, the figures from the CNS department and also the population projection by 2041. So during the next uh, 30 years or so, the expenditure is about um, $92.2 billion. And uh, according to this uh, 246 uh, sharing ratio, then the average um, revenue should be $94.2 billion. In other words, every year on average, there will be a surplus of about uh, $2 billion. I'm talking about uh, the annual surplus is about $2 billion. And in 30 years, it should um, accumulate to quite a um, sizable figure. All right. Uh, well, we don't have to worry about uh, what Francis Louis said that uh, the um, is going to burst, uh, so it's going to be sustainable. And we have also got some reports saying that uh, in Canada, the contribution, the total contribution rate is less than 10%, and still is sustainable up until 2075. And therefore, if you need the data, I can provide it to you. So that's uh, by way of our submission to this council. All right, third, on supplementary information under the package, that's very important. We have three items here. They are all very important. I hope that uh, you can refer to that. First, well, we support that um, there should be a universal pension scheme and uh, the employers should be contributing 6%. And the justification for that, uh, well, in 42 countries in Asia, the average contribution by employers is uh, 11%. So the average uh, contribution by employers is 11%. So we have looked at 42 countries and in OECD countries. So that's, well, there are four, uh, 34 countries. and. Um, we are talking about the first tier of um, public pension scheme, and the average contribution rate by employers is 11.2%, and uh, the total contribution rate is 19.6%. And in our proposal, well, employers uh, will be contributing 6%, and then 6%, uh, what? So 5% uh, for the MPF scheme and 6% uh, for the universal pension scheme. That's in line with the international trend. And the total contribution is already quite low because if you look at 34 countries under the OECD, uh, it's um, more than 20%. And in Taiwan, they've already set up this um, uh, annuity, the national uh, annuity in 2008. So uh, other than teachers, uh, public or civil servants, and uh, those from the army, they will be eligible for this, but then it's not uh, universal, and the total contribution rate is 12%. Uh, in 2010, China had approved a social insurance act, and the enterprises, just the employers, are contributing 20%. In Shenzhen, this law has been enacted. Uh, in 2012, they uh, contribute 13 percent. So Hong Kong employers, uh, Hong Kong doesn't have any, uh, but Hong Kong doesn't have any per universal pension. 
So when Hong Kong investors build factories outside of Hong Kong, they have to contribute more than 11 percent. So there's no reason why they can't afford 11 percent. My second point, uh, it's a new addition. The proposal can help the government uh, save on social welfare, old age allowance, and old age living allowance. The reason is, aside from increasing expenditure, we can save uh, expenses. So John Chang's uh, concern uh, is uh, not uh, uh, is not a substantial point. In 2014, uh, OAA OALA uh, uh, exceeded 28 billion. That's just our forecast. It's uh, figures according to uh, Social Welfare Department and uh, Census Department. So in 2014. Government expenditure on these three forms of subsidy uh, did it exceed 28 billion? If you include that and assume uh, that we have 40 percent of elderly who do not claim the old age uh, allowance, so if uh, there's five percent that is not claimed, then uh, the average contribution is only 29.1 billion. So by 2015. If you calculate the three forms of six, uh, three forms of subsidies, it's just 29 billion. So from next year onwards, the th if nothing is done, uh, this will increase because of the aging population. So it will be more than 29 billion. But our proposal in 30 years, it's just an average of 29 uh, billion. That is the current figure. So the government does not need to increase expenditure, and they can. Uh, set up this universal pension. Uh, last point in C, Hong Kong employers, why do they need to contribute 2%? Uh, 40, there are 42 countries in Asia. The average contribution is 7%. The OECD is 8.4%. So we are just in line, uh, and Hong Kong employers sh employees should contribute 2%. So if you look at the total fund, if the males are in 30 years time, they'll be 84. They will enjoy 19 years. So it's, uh, it uh, adds up to 910,000. So for the high earners, who earn 95,000 per month, they can uh, receive their contribution. And, and that does not include their parents and spouses. Uh, they will get much more. That is just their own personal contribution. So this 95,000, we have it in brackets uh, with a starting salary of 20,000 to the end salary of 170,000. They start at 20,000 and at their final salary is uh, uh, 170,000. They can still, their, what they receive will not be less uh, than what they've contributed. So they would, uh, sh they should eagerly participate in this contribution. They are just uh, contributing an extra 2% and they can support this uh, universal pension of 4000 per month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mock. Next, we have the Hong Kong Federation of Trade Union Rights and Benefits Committee, Mr. Tam Kin Sun and Yip Wai Meng. Today, we're talking about uh, the FTU pension plan. There are different plans, and I think uh, we all want to set up a universal pension plan to safeguard the working class uh, lifestyle after retirement. 
So we've already submitted the document and PowerPoint to the Secretariat. If necessary, you can get a copy from the Secretariat or contact us. And you can get a copy of our PowerPoint. The FTU is very concerned uh, about this issue. In 1994, we proposed a comprehensive uh, pension plan. And there were two tiers to the plan. There was a uh, social insurance and a pension plan. And in fact, it was a three-party insurance plan. And last year, the FTU, in light of the new economic development and situation, we had amended our comprehensive retirement plan. But uh, we still insist on two principles. There are two scenarios, the uh, social insurance and pension. So our comprehensive retirement plan includes the MPF plus a three-party contribution insurance plan. And um, there are some principles. These principles are uh, we should try to cover uh, the whole society. And as other speakers have illustrated, we feel our welfare or the comprehensive retirement plan should shake off uh, the concepts of uh, subsidy. We want people to retire in dignity. So we feel that the government and participants should share responsibility because we should all contribute to uh, retirement plans. And we have also made reference to the World Bank Five Pillars, and we hope that uh, our proposal is also uh, in compliance with the World Bank Five Pillars. It should all the plan should also be sustainable. We've did the arithmetic and we feel that it should be sustainable and it should be able to meet the 2041 uh, old age peak. Uh, our plan uh, proposes that uh, it should be implemented as soon as possible. In 2016, we should uh, implement this plan. In the early phases, our, we suggest that the government should consider using the land fund because the land fund should, has some 200 odd billion, and the, the government is just uh, this fund is just laying idle. So the government should divert the land f fund and use these funds to support our retirement plan. We hope that the government can divide this 200 odd billion over 22 years into the uh, retirement fund. In the first year, uh, it should set aside 50 billion in another two years, another 50 billion, and, and then every 10 years uh, in this land fund, they should divert the balance in two phases into this retirement fund. Another proposal is we feel this plan the social insurance plan should be managed and invested by the monetary authority and the administrative end should be handled by the social welfare department or a specialized department and we heard that in the low income subsidy there is a new agency to handle it 
So this new agency, could they undertake this responsibility? We think so. In our plan, we will retain the MPF because uh, we have always insisted that MPF is one stepping stone towards universal pension. If we were to scrap the MPF, we are afraid that the chaos created might be might uh, be something that is beyond our abilities. So we uh, hope that the the offsetting mechanism of MPF be scrapped because if it's not scrapped, the MPF cannot play its role. And second, we feel there should be legislation to reduce the administrative fees of MPF. It should be capped. Uh, and we should also have a public fund or a pre-fund or whatever you call it. But the nature is similar. Uh, it should be a public fund to allow uh, workers to save their uh, provident fund. This MPF, we feel the contribution ratio should be maintained, but uh, it should be changed from 5% to 4%. No, the one percent uh, will add uh, another zero point five percent to it, and the employee employers will contribute one point five percent into the social insurance fund. The MPF contributions will continue to contribute four percent, but we need to point out that. In the social insurance side, the 1.5% contribution, there should not be a ceiling. Uh, we suggest that the retirement pay, payout should be between 25% to 30% of the medium uh, salary. So if you use the current figures of 13000 uh, it would or it works out to three thousand two hundred and fifty. That's using current figures. So, assuming uh, the government by twenty sixteen will uh, accept our proposal, then we'll have to use uh, the twenty five thirty percent of the median salary uh, to determine our retirement fund. Another scenario is uh, the social insurance fund. We want to retain uh, contributions to the elderly because some elderly might have more difficulties. So we want to retain the CSS A for elderly because they might get more than 3,250. So they should be able to collect the difference. But uh, the elderly CSS A system should be reviewed. Uh, we want uh, to scrap the uh, re uh, harsh uh, requirements. And where does this f fund come from? Uh, we mentioned over 22 years, the land fund of $200 billion should be injected into the insurance fund. Second, the government... Uh, fruit allowance, so OALA and uh, old age allowance. Uh, we want to maintain this. Uh, uh, and, third, and third, we suggest that in the budget surplus, 5% of the surplus should be injected into the insurance fund. Uh, fourth, the taxable uh, income should be increased and uh, the extra 1% should be into injected into the insurance fund. And in reforming the MPF, 
all contributions should uh, be uh, reduced by 1%. And at the same time, the insurance fund uh, should have 1.5% uh, going into this uh, social security fund. So that's the source of funding for the retirement protection fund. And we have also done some projections and we believe that uh, even by 2071, this fund should still have a surplus. As regards the detailed uh, projections, we have already given the details uh, to the Secretariat in our PowerPoint presentation. You can take it back and uh, look into it. So all in all, with regard to the FTU's uh, retirement protection package, uh, number one, um, uh, we have to reform the MPF system. And second, is a universal retirement protection system. And all the others uh, who are not currently covered by the MPF, uh, including homemakers, uh, housewives, they will all be covered. And then they'll be able to benefit immediately. And that's very important because uh, for the elders, they'll be able to get some money. And then for people who have to support their parents, even for the younger people, they'll be able to have their burden eased. Uh, and third, it has to be a tripartite contribution system. As we just said, for retirement protection, it's something universal. And therefore, the entire community will have to share the responsibility. And number four, it has to be sustainable. And we believe that our package is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, professional comments. Which one of you will speak? Yes, please. Our professional commons um, presentation is in three parts. Our vision and guidelines of the proposed scheme, the pension levels and components of the proposed scheme, and the technical proof of its financial feasibility. Our vision is for a caring society with pro retirement protection for all, a fairer mechanism with wealthier people contributing more, a sustainable scheme that the community finds affordable. Our scheme takes reference from the guidelines of the World Bank's five pillar model. Um, and at the present time, Hong Kong has in place four of those five pillars. And the missing pillar is the mandatory pay as you earn uh, uh, basis old age pension. Um, our guidelines for the old age pension eligibility is that it's eligible for all permanent residents of Hong Kong. There should be no means test. In terms of affordability, the contributions for our old age pension are additional to the contributions that are already being made to the MPF. Funding is the most crucial and contentious issue as far as retirement protection is concerned. OECD recommends that after 40 years work, a retiree's income should be a minimum of between 50 and 60 percent of the average wage. Now in Hong Kong terms, uh, based on the March June 2013 average wage, which is the most recent figures we could find, the average wage is 14,100 uh, per month, which means that a retiree should be getting between 7,050 and 8,460 uh, Hong Kong dollars per month. Now even with MPF as well as old age pension, many, many people will not be able to achieve that at this point in time. Um, so it is very important, we believe, to retain MPF and to improve MPF. Under our scheme, the wealthier people will contribute more. There will be equal contributions from employers and employees, and there will also be a government, government contribution, which is kept to a fairly low level. The financial uh, sustainability um, is based on a moderate pension rate, cross-generational support, accrued benefits from investment returns, early injection of government funding to generate more investment return, and the fund should maintain surplus uh, all the time. Next, uh, I'll be talking about the structure of our retirement protection package. Basically, there will be three types of people. First, um, during their prime years, uh, they're able to work, so we call them the labor force. And second, uh, uh, so the uh, 
the labor force and their families, and of course uh, that would also include those who have not worked, uh, and uh, and then uh, the disadvantaged groups. So let's see uh, what are the sources of uh, revenue that can support them. And in our consideration, we have proposed that there should be um, a universal pension scheme, and then for those who have worked and also their families, they should have their own savings, and uh, there would also be family support. And then for those who have worked, they would also have uh, MPF. So that would also uh, show that uh, it's a system under which if you work more, then you'll be able to get more. And under the CSSA system, that should also be uh, further divided into two parts for the basic rate. We suggest that we should have this uh, old age pension element uh, included, and then for the original CSSA and the special allowances or grants, well, that should be kept. Because uh, for the basic um, rate under the uh, OAP, that would not be able to sustain them, and therefore they would need further assistance. So under the structure, so what is what are the components? First, uh, on eligibility, everyone over the age of 65, so long as they are permanent residents of Hong Kong, there is no means test. And then as far as the amount is uh, concerned, in 2017, it should be set at $4,000, because uh, a Professor Charles report is released in June, then the entire community will take a year to come up with a consensus, and then it will take another year for us to prepare legislation and to prepare for the setting up of the scheme. That's why we expect, we suspect that uh, we, we we will only be able to implement it uh, by 2017, and we should not leave it uh, to the next term of the chief executive. And therefore, within this term of government, we should deal with it uh, as soon as as far as possible. And it should also be adjusted uh, in line with inflation. And uh, for the funding source, uh, that's also the main concern of the community. We believe that it should be a tripartite contributory system. And uh, for employee and employer, they will have to contribute a an extra rate of 2.5% on top of the MPF uh, contribution. And then for employees earning $6,500 a month, they should be exempted. And then in terms of the ceiling, we'll set it at $80,000. That's that has taken into account that uh, in our projection, we believe that uh, there should be sufficient funding and there is no need for us to accumulate too much money in the reserve. And then turning to government's commitment, well, other than the basic rate under the CSSA and also for the OALA and also for other belt welfare payments, these are the money that, ha that has been given to them and they should be injected into the new fund. And we also propose that there should also be extra um, injection. So during the first five years, we're talking about $50 billion. And then in the subsequent years, uh, for every five years, is $25 billion. And according to our projection, we find out that uh, if it's done on a sustained manner, then we might be accumulating too much money. That's why we, su we suggest that uh, after 2047, there is no need for any further injection because the fund will be financially sustainable. So that's the crude projection. And by 2046, if you look at the employer, employee and uh, government uh, contribution under the new system, so for con employer, employee, so we are talking about uh, 10.6 to 10.7, and then for the SAF government, it's only one. So as far as the government is concerned, it should not pose any extra burden. So what we are looking at uh, is the red part. So in our projection, by 2017, the extra funding from the administration is about um, $271 billion, but then by 2060, uh, the cumulative uh, surplus will be up to $591.8 billion. In other words, we don't need to use the funding or injection from the administration, so our fund will be very, very healthy. And for the $500 plus billion, that should be able to cater for at least one year's spending. So in terms of the financial sustainability and uh, soundness, it's very sound. Next, um, my colleague will tell you more about uh, how we can uh, maintain um, a balanced budget.
Um, good morning, everyone. Just now, Mr. George Cotterley and Mr. Chen Kai Ming have already explained to you uh, some of the features of our scheme and under our proposal. Well, our scheme is very similar to many other proposals, but then we would also take into account whether the scheme is uh, feasible, viable and sustainable. So some might wonder if uh, it's going to burst and uh, we should not uh, casually say that uh, it's going to burst or not. We have to make sure that uh, in the design of it, uh, it will not burst. Uh, we also have to bear in mind a number of factors and uh, we also need to have different assumptions and those have been used as some of the details of the uh, proposal and we also have to consider the implications of them. Well, when people worry about whether the scheme will burst, uh, well, the main reason is that uh, there might not be sufficient funds and as Mr. Chen Kai Ming just said, we have to make sure that there will be sufficient surplus and of course uh, the more the better. But we have also factor one thing in, that is uh, if we are able to make sure that there will be enough funds uh, for at least uh, one year's spending. So for the grey column, so that's the uh, amount in terms of uh, pension payment. And uh, when the number reaches about uh, um, 57 or $570 billion or $590 billion by 2060, then we believe that that's an appropriate level. And um, our package is somewhat different from the others in the sense that uh, well, the retirement scheme should not just be looking at a horizon of uh, 10, 20 years. It's a long-term scheme and therefore, uh, and of course, uh, it cannot be um, forever and therefore, we are only projecting into the next uh, 50 years. But then when we do that, uh, we can see that some of the data might not be readily available from of, from some of the official res from some of the re official uh, sources for example the cns department can only give us uh, a projection about uh, 20 years and we try to do uh, the projection for another 20 years that's why we have been able to look at uh, the horizon up to 2060 so for any retirement protection scheme if there are any problems. Uh, very often uh, we would have a baby boom, so we would be looking at the problems uh, um, surrounding a baby boom and we're talking about those uh, born in the 50s or 60s and then uh, by 2060, well for the youngest baby, uh, he should have reached the age of 95 and therefore that should be sufficient to uh, meet the problem that might arise uh, from the baby boom. So after obtaining the population data, we also need to have other economic and financial data. Well, for unemployment rate, that's also an important factor because uh, contribution or the level of our contribution uh, will depend on the uh, size of the working force. So we have to rely on the data supplied to us uh, by the uh, by, by some economic analysis data company, and uh, we try to look at uh, some down case or s some uh, uh, downside uh, scenarios, and we try to make some modifications. And uh, between 2012 and 16, we try to reduce it by one percent, and then after 2017, we try to reduce it by 0.5 percent, and then for the other assumptions very often we would assume that uh, some of the data would also have to be adjusted uh, in line with the uh, consumer price index and one of the assumptions under the uh, CPI would also have to be worked out and that's also based on uh, economic uh, data analysis companies uh, data. The last assumption is 
uh, investment return. As with other suggestions, we assume that the foreign exchange fund could be uh, uh, the average return between 2004 and 2010 is about 4.9%. So I want to emphasize these assumptions. Oh, we're not using them as a forecast. Uh, it's just uh, a calculation method. And using these uh, methods, we get some statistics, and they are reference for decision making. So, given less than ideal conditions, uh, this is something. Uh, <clears throat> this is where uh, our risk uh, uh, affordability ratio comes in. So, if you cannot bear risk, you might need to be more conservative. If your risk affordability, whether it is pension amount or employee, employer, government contribution uh, adjustment, you can take into account uh, less than ideal conditions. We've also conducted some pressure tests. So if these assumptions, if they're less than ideal, what will happen? We find that there is an impact, but uh, it would not uh, lead to a disruption of the fund. The fund can still mm -hmm. operate. So uh, that would conclude our sharing. So uh, in the remaining time, we'll ha hear from legislators and government officials. Uh, since we have to finish at 12.45, we'll need to keep Q&A uh, at <coughs> three minutes. Poon Siu Peng. I'll have to thank the deputations for <coughs> uh, the sharing. Well, the models are similar in many uh, aspects. So three-party contributions. Uh, seems that uh, 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 it's similar, and uh, they also call for government uh, uh, funding. We are aware that Professor Nelson Chow is writing a report, and it will only be available at the end mm -hmm. of June. Well, uh, we would like to convene a meeting on 22nd of July. So I'd like to ask the government they're saying that uh, the P poverty commission will scrutinize it so is there a timetable so because no matter how good these proposals are if it cannot be implemented cannot be legislated because we've already been struggling uh, uh, on this issue for some 20 30 years so i want to ask the secretary do you have any specific timetable uh, so uh, we can uh, work together towards uh, universal pension? Thank you, Mr. Poon. The government is concerned about an aging society and the problems arising from it. That's why <clears throat> you can see in this year's policy address, uh, one of the focus was on <clears throat> uh, serving the elderly. So Professor Nelson Chow's report uh, reflects the government, uh, the, attach, the importance the government attaches to this issue. So after we receive the report, the Poverty Commission will follow up. We will have an open attitude. Well, so assuming you receive the report on 1st of July, when will the Commission on Poverty convene a meeting and mm -hmm. come up with a decision? Well, a lot of people are calling for a solution in the current chief executive's term. 
So I want to ask, do you have a timetable? Have you set up meeting dates? And will you submit the report? I said, stated very clearly just now, the Poverty Commission will scrutinize the report and uh, they will come to a decision very soon. Uh, Mr. Chen Kok Chu. Well, it seems that the five deputations uh, have provided figures all the way up to 2041 and 2060. <coughs> it seems that the pressure is now on the government. But we don't know what the government uh, intends to do. So, so I'd like to follow up on the MPF. Uh, you, some people want to retain the MPF. Uh, they <coughs> call for 246% contributions. But if you uh, deploy all, the whole MPF, it's 10%. Um, and uh, uh, if uh, you call for 4% government contribution, that's 14%. So, first of all, why do you ignore the MPF? Or why do you deploy some of the MPF? Uh, second question, who will handle the investment and operation of the universal pension. The MPF is now handed over to insurance companies. It seems that uh, is the government the best organization to run the pension? The third question is uh, housewives would need to contribute and uh, uh, then of course the husband would have to uh, contribute. So, uh, so what is your view on this? Uh, which deputation would like uh, <coughs> to respond? Well, we want to scrap MPF, uh, but we will allow a transition period to allow uh, them to uh, to allow them to switch jobs. They should contribute to the Universal Pension Fund and we want the government to run the fund. It should not be hand, uh, the, um, uh, the management fees should not be eroded by insurance companies. Mr. Leung or Mr. Mock, in all our papers we uh, have mentioned uh, the Provident Fund. I want to clarify. We want the current MPF. Uh, we want to fine-tune it. It should be voluntary. We need to, to remove the mandatory part. So, and we have a Nobel Economics Prize winner and economist approval. Uh, we also have a World Bank uh, long-term employee uh, proposing this. And their suggestion and reasonings, uh, we've photocopied these. Uh, they call for a universal pension and a voluntary provident fund. I want to uh, also highlight a, a study. Uh, it's not very complex. It's uh, by the Hong Kong CSS, and we the investment should be handled by the monetary authority. And between 1994 and 2011, they can have a investment return of 5.9 percent. That uh, figures by the uh, monetary authority. Regarding the MPF, we feel strategically we don't want to make enemies. We've heard the financial sector have uh, 
some strong opinion on issues. Well, we have historic reasons uh, at play here, since it was a historic decision. So we'll just set aside for the time being. Now, regarding investment, the MA has a good <coughs> reputation, and we feel they can run the fund. Uh, regarding housewives, whether they should contribute, we our proposal has uh, sufficient funding, and if you want an increase uh, in funding, then do you also do you also call are you also calling for a reduction in some for some employers, because the employer should not be funding your uh, family. Uh, we don't want to uh, affect the employer contribution, uh, uh, so maintaining. Uh, uh, I think uh, housewives do not need to contribute. Regarding the MPF, we had already mentioned our stance in implementing the universal pension. We want it to be smooth. We don't want to create more problems or chaos. Because even if you deploy it to the, ins the insurance fund, there, there are some problems that we might not be able to forecast. So we think it should be simpler. We should make it simple. The, we're not saying we're not changing. We just want to fine-tune it. We want to uh, uh, scrap the offsetting mechanism. We want to cap the management fees. Even in the pre-fund, if we have a pre-fund, uh, it should be uh, invested by the monetary authority. To Even if you outsource it, <coughs> Uh, this is uh, uh, problematic. We should use the MA. We think that uh, these are our preliminary views. Uh, it's, uh, our proposal uh, is more uh, middle path. It utilizes the MPF. Half of the MPF will be converted into the universal pension because we don't want extra contributions from employee employers. MPF has a lot of problems. We've done some surveys. Some 40% of uh, employees want to scrap uh, MPF. So you can see that uh, uh, there is a lot of dissatisfaction with MPF. The government needs to solve these problems. But we see that the administration or the CE, they don't have any uh, action on the offsetting mechanism. So if they don't resolve it, it will just simmer. And second, how should the money be handled? We have some savings elements. There's been a lot of discussion. Some people suggest uh, uh, have a MA man manage it, or should we have an independent public body? Oh, so we maintain an open attitude, <coughs> but the but we cannot have the MPF allowing the market uh, to erode uh, retirement savings. That is not acceptable. Universal pension should not become a second MPF. Professor Mock? The MPF ensures that there is a 5% employer contribution. If you just scrap it, it would have a large impact on retirement protection. It would also affect uh, interest groups. Uh, it would uh, generate objection from interest groups. So we want a voluntary program. If they feel it's beneficial to them, 
they can contribute 5% and the employee needs to contribute 5%, but they can also reduce it to 1, 2 or 3%. That will uh, give them choice. So in other words, they can, we should uh, allow the employees uh, to make decisions. Well, we shouldn't scrap it uh, after fighting, lobbying for it for a few years. Thank you, Chairman. I have to thank the five deputations. Uh, we've received more than five uh, proposals. So I hope that uh, the secretary or study groups uh, can uh, look at uh, the other proposals. But I think uh, people are more concerned about uh, the interaction between Professor Nelson Chow and the secretary. He was recruited last year. Was he aware that uh, the financial secretary uh, also had his working group looking at this? So was he aware and that he needed to make reference <coughs> and uh, abide by the plans? Oh, was he aware? Secretary? The answer is very simple because uh, the interaction between the professor and us, well, the professor is doing this as an independent. He's both an academic. He also has uh, a team of experts, and uh, some of them are actually advisors to the uh, World Bank. So it's a very high-level working group, and therefore he's leading the team. And uh, well, he has met uh, many of you here. And then at the earlier stage, the working group appointed by the FS on the long-term fiscal planning, all right, they also came up with some data. And as the professor also had uh, done some research, and therefore they are exchanging data. But then for the uh, study done by uh, Professor Chow, it's independent, it's uh, objective, and it's impartial. So he's aware that uh, the FS uh, is doing this uh, projection. That's why he has to use the data from the FS. Is that right? Or is it that, uh, all right, uh, you're thinking about this, but then we have this report, you will have to think about this. No. We have to take into account the actual situation. We have, an, we have a working group within the administration with some data, and Professor Chow's uh, team also had some data, and therefore they tried to uh, align the figures in order to make sure that uh, the figures uh, that they use will be most uh, accurate, because apparently uh, what Professor Chow has been telling the public uh, is like a roller coaster. Sometimes he sounded very optimistic, at other times uh, it's very pessimistic. So apparently he's trying to um, influence uh, public opinion, because yesterday he said that uh, what well, was an OAP of uh, three thousand uh, dollars, it should be okay. But then earlier on he was more conservative. So. Do you agree that he's trying to um, influence our public opinions? Well, I believe that uh, Professor Chow is very dedicated. Uh, he has a heart for it. So do you have a heart for that too? So I am here listening to your views. So um, uh, do, you, do you not think that uh, I don't have a heart uh, even if uh, I am prepared to sit here and listen to your views? All right, uh, we have to end by 12.40 and we will have to deal with um, how we're going to proceed uh, next time. All right, two more members would like to speak, so one minute each. Lao Chia Kei and uh, Lai Yun Mei, anyone else? Uh, if not, then we'll draw a line there. All right, two questions. They are very simple. All right, Mr. Chiao, can you tell us uh, categorically with regard to the economic um, journal report uh, dated uh, May the 14th? Is that accurate? Because uh, after looking at the uh, report by the long-term uh, fiscal planning working group. Um, uh, it cited a, uh, it cited, uh, a breath of relief because um, universal retirement protection has been proven not workable. So is that the case? Can you tell us whether or not it's true, Mr. Chair? I'd like to know concerning the long-term fiscal projection by the FS. So apparently that has to be factored into. 
Professor Chow's report. I think it's a very serious matter because you're interfering with academic freedom because the nature of the two reports would be very different. On the one hand, uh, your report is very pessimistic, and apparently the situation will be even worse than the two financial turmoil. And now you're trying to impose that on the projection on Universal Retirement Protections report. So, uh, Bureau Director, when did you learn about this? So, can you be honest with us? All right. Uh, so that's the way we um, operate. So you can only channel the questions uh, via the chair. All right, Mr. Tenkapil asked about the roller coaster. That's true, because I think uh, Ms. Lai Yunmei also made a point about Economic Journal's uh, article. And um, another question is about uh, uh, how you're going to um, align the two reports. Well, we're not going to comment on any press report. Uh, we absolutely attach importance to that. We're not going to comment on press reports because they have uh, press freedom. But then uh, the senior management within the administration is highly concerned about retirement protection. If not, uh, then we would not have uh, engaged uh, Professor Chow to lead his team in conducting the study. So please do give us a bit more room so that uh, Professor Chow will be able to submit the report up by the 1st of July and then we'll be able to take the matter forward from then onwards. All right, uh, so three minutes each. We have members asking for the second time, Tang Ka Piu and Chung Kwok and Peter Chung. And we also have Fernando Chung and myself. All right, I'll see if there is time. All right, three minutes for Lang Kwok Hong. Well, uh, we haven't um, finished our Philippa string because we haven't really cast our votes. All right, if there are so many comments and if you had made them during the Philippa string, then at least um, a few more hundred thousand people will be listening to your remarks. And uh, so long as you can get some members to speak on your behalf, it's okay. But then um, the situation is really lamentable. Okay, for John Zhang's uh, behavior is totally unacceptable. He's treating Professor Chow or Professor Nelson Chow as his puppet. All right, you can release your report. How come you're imposing your report on the other's report? So all you need to do is to look at your report. Two reports can be placed side by side. All right, one is a report from the Working Group on Long-Term Fiscal Planning, and then we can have Nelson Chow's report. Why do they have to uh, incorporate your data? So even if it's just uh, an academic study, it's not acceptable. And second, it's lovable. All right, I won't quote him, blame me for Philippa String. And as a result, uh, well, fewer canned food can be supplied. But then um, the FTU is also asking the land fund to provide the injection. And then John Zhang's uh, package would also use a uh, land fund as the seed money. All right, it's a lab on the face of the FTU. And still, he put the blame on me. He pointed an accusing finger at me. So what kind of person is this? So why doesn't he commit suicide then? All right. I'm not interested in discussing this any further. All right, for the academics here. Well, there is uh, one saying by uh, Karl Marx that you have to listen to. So the problem is that we have to liberate the world or else uh, it won't resolve the problems on its own. We cannot just sort things out uh, by sitting here and discussing things here. All right, uh, um, well, people blame me for Philippa String, but then there would be a, uh, an outburst of uh, people's uh, sentiment and dissatisfaction. So do they have to kneel down? Do they have to go on hunger strike? Do you want that to happen? So do we have to wait till that happens uh, before? You're prepared to make amends. So this is really regrettable. All right, uh, in Siwa Long's uh, election manifesto, he said that uh, in due course we will have to save some money in order to take care of the elderly. And Nelson Chow also came up with something, saying that we have to have this uh, annuity. And then John Zhang said that uh, I have to break the piggy bank, and then I'll have to save all the money. So are you crazy? Have you gone berserk? Even if I do not criticize you, it's not going to work. So is that C. Y. Leung, who is the chief executive, or is it John Zhang, who is the chief executive? So who is lying? Is it uh, is C. Y. Leung lying, or is it uh, John Zhang, who is lying? But then why is it that you are meddling with the work of Nelson Chow? Why don't you just uh, go and kill yourself? Next, uh, Fernando Zhang. Fernando Zhang. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, deputations, for coming to, uh, to explain to us your package. From what I've heard, well, whether it's some um, Kai Fong or residents uh, group or some professional body, trade unions or whatever, basically what you're telling us is that uh, we do not want a means-tested scheme. We want a universal retirement protection scheme. And uh, of course, the alliance is uh, talking about some 70 plus groups. So my question for the bureau director is this. All right, the bureau director has been worried that uh, with a universal retirement protection scheme, is that a community-wide consensus? Because uh, we've been seeing that apparently there has not been any consensus fostered. But then, um, Madam Chair, even including the FTU all along, we've been asking for a universal scheme. So my question for the Bureau Director is this. Well, for people, all right, in preparation for the retirement protection scheme, all the deputations here are telling you that uh, we don't want any means test. We want it to be universal. So what's the attitude of the administration? Bureau Director. Madam Chair, we are still awaiting the report from Professor Chow's team. So everything will be contingent upon the report because I'm sure it's going to be a very uh, detailed report including some actuarial analysis, including which scheme will be financially sustainable and affordable. So I'm sure the report will come up with the details. Madam Chair, of course, everyone is awaiting the report by Professor Chow. But then just now, the bureau director, well, someone suggested, and according to the press report, uh, apparently the uh, bureau director refused uh, to comment on this report as reported in the press. All right, we also have so many deputations here. We have actuaries, and they've also done a lot of actuarial projections um, in their proposal. So still, you're insisting on waiting for the report by Professor Chow. All right, we are having a meeting here, and we have all the deputations here, and they've given you a lot of uh, professional uh, suggestions. So I'd like to ask you, Bureau Director, all of them claim that they have done actuarial projections and that their proposals are financially viable, and all they are asking for is a universal retirement protection scheme so that uh, the elders will be able to um, retire with dignity. So what's your view? Well, the administration's view is positive and pragmatic. That's why the professor's uh, team has met with all the deputations here. And I'm sure he will further an an analyze the um, data provided uh, by these deputations. And they he will incorporate that in the report. And we will consider all of them. All right, it's my turn. I think um, uh, the bureau director and the administration are putting Professor Chow on the spot. So if you're only going to show us what you think is right, it's not meaningful at all. All right, the community, the community is waiting. So it's not um, um, a very... Um, um, peaceful wait. All right. Uh, well, I've known some of them for many years. Uh, for example, Henry Mock and and, um, and, Lump and April Leung. I've known them for ages. So we have done a lot of our uh, interviews and research. And that's why when you look at the proposal that we have presented today, in fact, uh, w well, some groups are not here because we asked for more comprehensive uh, data. So I think the packages that are presented here have gone through many rounds of discussion with various stakeholders. And if you ask me, I think all of them are very pragmatic. Where does the money come from? All of them are asking for some uh, $50 billion. And even for the FTU, we are asking for some $200 billion. But then that would be uh, injected in stages. So technically, all these uh, problems uh, can be resolved. But of course, 
Well, the deputy chairman asked you, and apparently you have all avoided that question. In fact, uh, objectively, we have to be very careful in looking at uh, uh, community or public opinion. Yes, we don't like the MPF, but then we don't want to change that, and we don't want the administration to shirk its responsibility or commitment. So, bureau director, you will have to understand that after several decades, uh, studies, uh, questionnaires, surveys, and everything, now we have come up with these packages, and you can notice that uh, there are similarities amongst the various packages proposed by the deputations. All right, if Pro Professor Chow's uh, package is going to be similar to ours, my impression that is that uh, it's going to be very similar. So my question for you, Bureau Director, is that next time when you come again, let's say in July, all right, uh, we may actually get you to come again in June. So when you come again, if you are not prepare to submit the full report uh, of Professor Chow to us, then we are not going to let you off the hook. Because the problem is that uh, you are putting Professor Chow at the forefront, so uh, he's going to be the one to be hit when there are criticisms. So are you going to submit uh, Professor Chow's full report to us uh, when he submits it uh, to the administration? Next, uh, when John Zhang's uh, working group um, is uh, providing data, uh, are they biased? So you will have to address some of these uh, queries by the community, or else uh, Professor Chow won't have uh, uh, the necessary room uh, for uh, preparing his report. The SAR Government Poverty Commission had recruited Professor Nelson Chow uh, to look into this. It in illustrates the uh, importance we attach to this topic. Uh, the professor had met with the, the different deputations and conducted actuarial analysis. This has never been done before. I, I agree, uh, Secretary. You have uh, provided the deputations' proposals for Professor Charles' analysis. Well, you need not worry. The professor is neutral. He will, after submitting the report to the government, the commission, the poverty commission will look into it very seriously. We will reflect your views to the poverty commission. There will be thorough discussion. Uh, we'll consider transparency, your right to know, and uh, it will be fair and equitable. Thank you. Uh, could we draw the line after uh, two more questions, one minute each? Uh, Vice Chairman, Tangapiu. Tangapiu can go first, one minute. I have a request that if we already have five proposals, then in our next meeting, could the government provide a written response to, regarding the five proposals? Do they accept it? Do they, what considerations do they have? Could they respond in writing? Well, that's difficult uh, because uh, Professor Chow's report is almost done. He has already uh, looked into the five deputations' proposals, so the government should not uh, provide input again because the professor, the consultant, has already uh, is already looking into this. Well, it seems that the uh, professor's report does not give any indication on what should be done next. Well, we want some neutral professional advice. Well, I hope uh, the chairman and vice chairman can rule on my uh, request. Well, just now, the secretary referred to the importance of the professor's report. We're waiting for it uh, as well, but we're worried that uh, the CE said it would be disclosed at an appropriate time. So, appropriate uh, term, appropriate uh, 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 that perplexes me. Well, the secretary said that he would uh, respond, but uh, he could respond by saying nothing. 
so what is the difficulty in presenting the whole uh, report verbatim? The P Poverty Commission, uh, they have a subcommittee on retirement and welfare benefits. Uh, Chairman, you are also a member of that committee, so you are aware of your uh, monitoring function. I think they can, they will be able to handle it. So just before we convene a meeting, we talked about uh, about the next meeting. Uh, so the report will only be available after July, uh, after June rather. So we have to thank the deputation for providing the views. So. Can we? Uh, we need to set some ground rules. The government has recruited Professor Chow, but we also need to get. We need to uh, to hear from the deputation side because now John Zhang has uh, interfered. Now we're not trying to pressure you. Well, you can see that. Uh, You, you should be able to feel uh, how negative sentiments have been simmering um, uh, amongst the grassroots. So we will convene uh, next meeting. We'll focus on principles. We should be one step ahead of the government. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of amendments they'll be proposing. It would be difficult to argue with the government if they already have a stance. So, what what is your sentiment? Okay, we'll convene the meeting in June. Yes, I've I've heard your opinion. Uh, the audience in the public gallery have been following this issue for decades. They're frustrated. Uh, so we're now waiting for the government. The government should uh, uh, keep its ears on the ground. Uh, okay, thank you. If we can adjourn here. Uh, Mr. Chung, the secretary, you're not responding, but your salary is hundreds of thousands of per month. If this senior official is not from the Social Welfare Department, the Social Welfare Bureau, if this newspaper report is inaccurate, the government should clarify it. Okay, thank you very much. We'll uh, meet again in June, and we have to thank the deputations. Thank you very much.